Is this thing working? Yeah? Uh, I'm supposed to stall until the water arrives. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> no? Is there anybody who can't hear me? Maybe that's a better question. Okay, then I'm coming through all right. Uh, the acoustics in this particular room are not all that good. Um, we appreciate your waiting a little while. We're running a bit behind schedule, but uh, I shall, as a part of my stall, make my introductory comments for uh, Ms. Levertov before she reads. I, I should say she's asked me to request if there's a photographer here that no pictures be taken. She doesn't uh, care for photographs, so I'm sorry to ruin your evening if you're planning to take a photograph. Ms. Levertov, author of 11 books of poems, is one of America's best contemporary poets. I say America's despite the fact that Ms. Levertov was born and grew up in England because she has lived and written in this country since 1947. Her work is anthologized virtually everywhere and has become standard reading matter in any contemporary poetry class. During the 1960s and the early 70s, Ms. Levertov was known for her stand against the Vietnam War. She was a political activist before it was fashionable to be one, speaking out on many volatile issues in her poetry. Today, she continues to speak out, insisting that the poet must be a total participant in life, not merely an observer. It is this perspective, I believe, which gives her poetry immediacy and relevance. She attains these qualities without becoming dogmatic or didactic because she is, as she would say, at the service of poetry. Ms. Levertov's own words express this relationship better than I can. The obligation of the poet is not necessarily to write political poems or to focus attention primarily on such poems as more relevant than other poems or fictions. The obligation of the writer is to take personal and active responsibility for his words, whatever they are, and to acknowledge their potential influence on the lives of others. When words penetrate deep into us, they change the chemistry of the soul of the imagination. We have no right to do that to people if we don't share the consequences. Ms. Levertov shares the consequences and cares very deeply about her craft. It is that concern, that dedication to poetry and to the reader which shines through in every line of her work and stirs in us the recognition of a genuine and important poet. I see the water has arrived. I'll ask that it be brought forward, and then I'll turn the podium over to Ms. Levertov. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Denise Levertov. Um, is, is this mic on? I guess I'd better use it then, because it is rather, a, it was described to me as, as a cavernous hall, and <laughs> um, it is rather large. I uh, like to avoid mics uh, usually because uh, they can play funny tricks on you and sort of gibber at you, but... Um, I'm going to read, uh, to begin with, a poem which is a letter. It's called Writing to Aaron. And before I begin with it, um, I should say that the first couple of poems I'll read are from a section of this book, Life in the Forest, that I called Homage to Pavese, and in which even the poems that are uh, 
in the first person are, I, I feel that they partake in some uh, degree of the, of the fictive uh, in the way that a short story uh, based on a personal experience becomes fiction and um, that all the poems in this section of the book are uh, related to narrative, although not, um, they are not tales with plots. Uh, they would be related more to, uh, they would resemble more a short story, short stories than, uh, than novels, certainly. But it's a certain kind of poem, and afterwards I'll be reading some different kinds. Writing to Aaron. After three years, a three-decker novel in 15 pages, which beginning to begin with? Since I saw you last, the doctor has prescribed me artificial tears, a renewable order. But that leaves out the real ones. Shall I write about them? What about comedy? Laughter, good news. I live in a different house now, but can give you news of most of the same people. That ignores the significance of the house, its tone of voice, and the sentence by sentence unfolding of lives into chapters. Your last letter told about sand dunes in winter and having the sea to yourself. Beautiful. I read it to the strangers in whose midst I was at the time. And that's the way we lost touch for so long. My response was the reading aloud instead of a letter. And we both moved house. A shifting of sand underfoot. Well, I could echo the sound of facts, their weather. Thunderclaps, rain hitting stone, rattle of windows. And spaces would represent sunlight when the wind gave over and everyone rested between the storms. Or chronological narrative. In the spring of 73, that summer, by then it was fall. All or nothing, and that would be nothing. Dust, parchment dried up, invisible ink. Maybe I'll leave the whole story for you to imagine, telling you only, a year ago, I said farewell to that poplar you will remember that gave us its open secret, pressed on us all we could grasp and more of vibrating silver green being, a tree tripping over its phrases in haste, eloquent aspen. I know you know it took my farewell for granted. What it had given, it would never take back. I know you know about partings, tears, eye drops, revisions, dwellings, discoveries. Mine or yours, those are the glosses. Talmudic tractats, a lifetime's study. The word itself is what we heard and shall always hear each leaf imprinted syllables in our lives. <clears throat> this one from that same group uh, which I called homage to Pavese because I'd been reading Pavese's um, poems uh, uh, written in the 1930s, which 
uh, and his essays about what he was trying to do in those um, in that book called um, Lavorare Stanca. Um, this one is called A Young Man Traveling. Oh, I would have been reading uh, that, uh, um, and I realized that although I wouldn't uh, be so presumptuous as, as to compare my poems with his poems in, in that book, um, or feel that uh, what I was trying to do was exactly what he outlined in his essays uh, of that period. Nevertheless, I uh, realized in reading them that there was some affinity between what he did there and what I was trying to do at the, at the time. This one is called A Young Man Traveling. And this is a young man who perhaps uh, is a composite of people that I have known in the external life, um, although I wouldn't be able to pinpoint uh, those components. But um, he appeared in my mind one day, this fictive young man. He seems to be um, of today because what it says about his relationship with the women in the story seems to be of today. On the other hand, there's something rather Henry Jamesian about him. He's obviously got money. The scene is Venice, and he has enough money to take a gondola. That takes a bit. And um, they evidently are staying at a rather posh hotel. A young man traveling. He is scared of the frankness of women which attract and, when he draws near to listen, may repulse or ignore him. This morning, in lazy sunlight's veil of clear and pale honey, poured from the sky's blue spoon, they were laughing talking over coffee about misadventures, lovers, their own bodies, and didn't stop when he came to join them stepping from indoor shade onto the charmed and dappled stone ground of their terrace. If any one of them had been alone there, surely his presence would have changed her. He'd have seen that flicker, the putting aside of her solitude to make room for him. Together, they seem almost blind to him. Later, when they have gone to see bubbles of glass blown into phantasmagoric precisions, he takes a gondola sliding past the palazzos and counts bridges it's not, he thinks to himself, at some dark place in his mind, an intersection of narrow, seldom navigated canals. Then I want their entire attention. That would demand, oh, a response nothing assures me I can give. It's that when I see their creature freedom, the way they can fling themselves into the day, as I, being a strong swimmer, fling myself sometimes into the ocean off a sailboat, then I envy them. If they had stopped, he wonders, when I came out to their table, interrupted themselves to acknowledge me alien, would I have felt more excluded or less? Their frankness, their uninterrupted friendship, the sunlight lacing their hair, their bright clothes, the three of them, their eyes friendly but without mercy, without the mercy of distance. When they admit me, passing the cream jug, to their laughter, laughter and even the confession of their own troubles about which they speak so simply, so freely, I am afraid The gondola shoots back out as if with a sighing triumph into the breadth 
and glitter of the Grand Canal, the golden facades, Vaporetti bustling, pigeons wheeling up from the piazza. He pays the silent gondolier to whom he has nothing to say, no way to convince him he is a person, and lands to stroll back to the hotel, back to wait till the women return, drawn by what he fears. Now read one more from that section, a short one, called A Woman Meets an Old Lover. <coughs> he with whom I ran hand in hand, kicking the leathery leaves down Oak Hill Path, thirty years ago, appeared before me with anxious face, pale, almost unrecognized, hesitant, lame. He whom I cannot remember hearing laugh out loud, but see in mind's eye, smiling, self-approving, wept on my shoulder. He who seemed always to take and not give, who took me so long to forget, remembered everything I had so long forgotten. I'm going to read from a, from a different section. I don't know if you'll be able to hear the kind of, kind of difference that I feel. Um, this is a poem called um, Talking to Grief. Ah, oh, grief, I should not treat you like a homeless dog who comes to the back door for a crust, for a meatless bone. I should trust you. I should coax you into the house and give you your own corner, a worn mat to lie on, your own water dish. You think I don't know you've been living under my porch. You long for your real place to be readied before winter comes. You need your name, your collar and tag. You need the right to warn off intruders, to consider my house your own, and me your person, and yourself my own dog. From time to time over many years, I have found myself writing poems which I felt like calling psalms. Now, I really don't, I haven't analyzed what it is that makes a poem seem to me to be um, a psalm. But um, I have one called City Psalm. I have one called Psalm Praising the Hair of Man's Body. Um, I can't really remember, but I think I have a couple of other ones. And then I have this one in this book, which is called Death Psalm, O Lord of Mysteries. <clears throat> she grew old. She made ready to die. She gave counsel to women and men, to young girls and young boys. 
She remembered her griefs. She remembered her happinesses. She watered the garden. She accused herself. She forgave herself. She learned new fragments of wisdom. She forgot old fragments of wisdom. She abandoned certain angers. She gave away gold and precious stones. She counted over her handkerchiefs of fine lawn. She continued to laugh on some days, to cry on others, unfolding the design of her identity. She practiced the songs she knew, her voice gone out of tune, but the breathing pattern perfected. She told her sons and daughters she was ready. She maintained her readiness. She grew very old. She watched the generations increase. She watched the passing of seasons and years. She did not die. She did not die, but lies half speechless, incontinent, aching in body, wandering in mind, in a hospital room. A plastic tube taped to her nose disappears into one nostril. Plastic tubes are attached to veins in her arms. Her urine runs through a tube into a bottle under the bed. On her back and ankles are black sores. The black sores are parts of her that have died. The beat of her heart is steady. She is not whole. She made ready to die, she prayed, she made her peace, she read daily from the lectionary. She tended the green garden she had made, she fought off the destroying ants, she watered the plants daily and took note of their blossoming. She gave sustenance to the needy, she prepared her life for the hour of death, but the hour has passed and she has not died. O oh, Lord of mysteries, how beautiful is sudden death when the spirit vanishes boldly and without casting a single shadowy feather of hesitation onto the felled body. O oh, Lord of mysteries, how baffling, how clueless, is laggard death, disregarding all that is set before it in the dignity of welcome. Laggard death that steals insignificant patches of flesh. Laggard death that shuffles past the open gate, past the open hand, past the open ancient, courteously waiting life. How many years is it now since 1945? I can't count very well. 35? Okay, so this was written three years ago then, on the 32nd anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, it could just as well have been written now on the 35th anniversary, and I think it's very pointful to keep reading it, because uh, anything that one can do to wake people up to 
the great danger that we all creatures of this planet uh, have been living with for a long time and which at the moment uh, we are edging daily, it seems, closer and closer to the brink of anything that one can do to alert people to that uh, seems to me worth the effort. Uh, on the 32nd anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I was taking part, as I have, um, I guess that was the first year that I did, but I have taken part in it um, uh, since then. Um, uh, when I've been in Boston um, at that time, in a, a vigil that uh, is held every year in downtown Boston, um, uh, through the three days, and um, people sort of spell each other, but it's a day and night um, uh, silent vigil, uh, silent except for the occasional chanting of um, uh, a Buddhist uh, priest from um, Thailand who lives in, in the area and who sometimes comes and chants and he wears his saffron robes and beats a little, a little drum, and sometimes people chant with him. Otherwise, it's silent. People standing, <coughs> standing there with, with signs that explain why they are there, and sometimes slowly walking around um, in a kind of um, square. <coughs> and I was thinking um, about where had I been in 1945 and realizing that I could remember very, very little about that occasion, understood very little of what had happened, I started asking other people who had been grown up enough to understand what, what was going on at that time. Um, uh, it was not that we were children and didn't know that anything had happened. And I found that one and all, they had really no comprehension of what a shattering um, uh, event in human history uh, that had been. They had had no such comprehension at the time, although those whom I spoke to had gained it as the years had passed. <coughs> On the 32nd or 35th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, A new bomb, big one, drops a long way beyond the fence of our mind's property. And they tell us, with this, the war is over. We are 20 years old, thereabouts. Now stale uniforms can fall off our backs, replaced by silk of youth, relief not all gasps from our mouths and widens ignorant eyes. We've been used to the daily recitation of death's multiplication tables. We don't notice the quantum leap. 87,000 killed outright by a single bomb. 51,000 missing or injured. We were nurses, refugees, sailors, soldiers, familiar with many guises of death. War had ended our childhood. We knew about craters, torpedoes, gas ovens. This we ignored. The rumor was distant traffic. Louder were our heartbeats. Summer was springtime. The war is over. And on the third day, no one rose from the dead at Hiroshima. And at Nagasaki, the exploit was repeated as if to insist we take notice. 73,000 killed by one bomb. 74,000 injured or missing, 
Familiar, simple arithmetic of mortal flesh did not serve. Yet I cannot remember. And Sid, Ruth, Betty, Matthew, Virginia, cannot remember August 6th or August 9th, 1945. The war was over, was all we knew, and a vague wonder, what next? What will ordinary life be like? Now ordinary life, as we know it, is gone. But the shadow, the human shadow graph sinking itself indelibly upon stone at Hiroshima as a man, woman, or child was consumed in unearthly fire, that shadow already had been for three days imprinted upon our lives. Three decades now we have lived with its fingers outstretched in horror, clinging to our future, our children's future, into history or the void. The shadow's voice cries out to us to cry out its nails dig into our souls to wake them. Something, it ceaselessly repeats, its silence, a whisper, its whisper, a shriek, while the radiant gist is lost and the moral labyrinths of humankind convulse as if made of snakes clustered and intertwined and stirring from long sleep. Something can yet be salvaged upon the earth. Try, try to survive, try to redeem the human vision from cesspits where human hands have thrown it as I was thrown from life into shadow. And one may view In fact, I'm not sure whether I ought to call it a poem because I don't feel sure that when it is printed, it will come off the page um, as fully as uh, a, 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 a wrought poem should do. Um, I think that perhaps this is a performance piece. Uh, see, I feel that poems which um, are fully wrought um, uh, must be susceptible both of um, uh, being read aloud and of being read in, in solitude with, sounded out perhaps in the head, but not necessarily aloud, uh, by a reader whose eye may linger here and there and perhaps backtrack in certain places and so forth and move, um, uh, yes, at the poem's pace, which is designated by the score, and yet uh, with um, something of his or her um, own reading pace too, um, and that a fully wrought poem is not fully um, experienced by the reader unless it is heard aloud, not necessarily read by the poet, but read aloud um, uh, with sonic fullness and read um, with the eye. What I call a performance piece is one which um, uh, is most susceptible only of the, of the, of the uh, performance, half of that whole. 
So I'm not sure about that, and you'll be able to see for yourselves uh, if you're interested, when it appears in um, Seven Days, which is a magazine that comes out of New York, but which is nationally distributed, and it's edited by David Dellinger. And this poem is going to be in there. It doesn't really have a title. It was just written for the anti-draft rally in Washington, D.C., March 22nd, uh, 1980. And another thing that, of course, conditions this kind of um, writing. I was not asked to write a poem, so it wasn't. I was asked to speak, but since I am a poet, I wanted to speak with a poem. And one thing that conditions that kind of, in a sense, occasional uh, uh, writing, the stimulus of a particular occasion uh, giving rise to the poem, is the fact that you know um, that. Uh, for an occasion like this, you're going to be reading through a public address system to a large audience. There were, in fact, 35,000 people there. Um, there are poems I wouldn't dream of reading over a public address system. Anyway, this is what I wrote. As the planet swings and sways into its new decade, under the raped moon's weary glance. I've heard them again. The voices of high school kids on the bus home to the projects, of college students, some of them female this time, in the swimming pool locker room, saying, if there's a war, if there's a war, I don't want to get drafted, but if there's a war, I'll go. If there's a war, I'd like to fight. If there's a war, I'll get pregnant. Bomb Tehran, bomb Moscow, I heard them say. Ah, they're the same ones, male and female, who ask, which came first? Vietnam or Korea? What was Millet? The same kids who think Ayatollah Khomeini's a quote, commie, who think World War II was fought against, quote, Reds, namely Hitler and some Japs. No violence they've seen on the flickering living room screen familiar since infancy, or the movies of adolescent dates, the dark, so much fuller of themselves, of each other's presence than of history, and the history anyway twisted, not that they'd know. The dark, vibrant with themselves, with warm breath, half-suppressed mirth, the wonder of being alive, terrified, entranced by sexual fragrance each gives off among popcorn, clumsy gestures, the weird response of laughter when on that screen death's happening. Wow, unreal. And people suffer or dream aloud. None of that spoon-fed violence prepares them. The disgusting routine horror of war eludes them. They think they would die for something they call America, vague as true dreams are not. Something they call freedom, the free world, without ever knowing what freedom means, what torture means, what relative means. They are free to spray walls with crude assertions, numbers, pathetic names free to disco, to disagree if they're in school with the professor. Great. They don't know that's not enough. They don't know ass from elbow, blood from ketchup. That knowledge is kept from them. They've been taught to assume if there's a war, there's also a future. They know not only nothing in their criminally neglected imaginations about the way war always meant not only dying, but killing. 
not only killing, but seeing not only your buddy dying, but your buddy in the act of killing, not nice. Not only your buddy killing, but the dying of those you killed yourself, not always quick and not always soldiers. Yes, not only the draft age people mostly not know how that kind of war has become almost a pastoral compared to new war, the kind in which they may find themselves. While the usual pink-faced men, smooth-shaved, overfed, placed in power by the parents of those expendable young, continue to make the decisions they are programmed for. But also, they know nothing at all about radiation, nothing at all about lasers, nothing at all about how the bombs the Pentagon sits on like some grotesque chicken caged in its nest and fed cancerous hormones exceed and exceed and exceed Hiroshima over and over and over in weight, in power, in horror of genocide. When they say, if there's a war, I'll go, they don't know they would be going to kill themselves, their mamas and papas, brothers and sisters, lovers. When they say, if there's a war, I'll get pregnant, they don't seem to know that war would destroy that baby. When they say, I'd like to fight for, quote, freedom, for, quote, the free world, for, quote, America, for whatever they think they'd be fighting for, those children, those children with braces on their teeth, fears in their notebooks, acne on their cheeks, dreams in their inarticulate hearts, whom the powerful men at their desks designate as the age group suitable for registration, they don't know they'd be fighting very briefly, very successfully, quite conclusively, for the destruction of this small lurching planet, this confused lump of rock and soil, ocean and air, on which our songs, cathedrals, gestures of faith and splendor have grown like delicate moss and now may or may not survive the heavy footsteps of our inexcusable ignorance the chemical sprays of our rapacious idiocy, our minds that are big enough to imagine love, imagine peace, imagine community, but may not be big enough to learn in time how to say no. My dear fellow humans, friends, strangers who would be friends, if there were time. Let us make time. Let us unite to say no to the drift to war, the drift to take care of little disasters by making a big disaster and then the last disaster from which no witness will rise, no seed. Let us unite to tell all we have learned about old-fashioned wars, vomit and shit, about new-fashioned wars, abrupt end to all hope. Unite to tell what we know to the whole-bodied young, unwitting victims lined up ready already like calves at the pen for slaughter. Share what we know until no more young voices talk of if there's a war, but all say no, and again, no to the draft, and no to war, and no to the sacrifice of anyone's blood to the corporate beast that dreams it can always somehow save its own skin. Let our different dream, and more than dream, our acts of constructive refusal generate struggle and love 
We must dare to win not wars, but a future in which to live. turn to something that I wrote um, in the South Pacific. I spent three weeks when I was coming back from Australia last year on the island of Tonga. And I wrote quite a lot of poems there. Most of them don't have anything to do with Tonga. Two or three of them do, and I'm going to read you two, two short poems from there. Um, one's a noontime poem, and the other's a night poem, and I'm just looking to see which I'll read. I think I'll read the daytime one first. It has a long title. Heights, depths, silence, unceasing sound of the surf. Are they birds or butterflies? They are sailing, too, not a flock, more silver white than the high clouds, blissful soy lovers in infinite azure. Below them, within the reef, green shallows, transparent, Beyond, bounded by angry lace that flails the coral, the vast, ironic, dark Pacific. And this one is called Tropic Ritual. <clears throat> Full moon's sharp command transforms the leaf spine of each palm frond to curved steel in absolute allegiance, uncountable scimitars hail the unwitnessed hour. The humans have withdrawn, curtained, shuttered, Stars fall, kamikaze of ecstasy. The tide submits and submits. The moon exacts penitent joy from lizards, blood from dreaming women. Dogs huddle, scared under the frangipani, which lets fall silently one flower into the sand. Um, I'm going to read you two poems about my education. Um, since um, in the um, gathering this afternoon, um, I think that somehow or other at some point the fact that I had not um, gone to school came up and students are always very um, thrilled and I may say envious to think of somebody who never went to school. <laughs> um, but I had um, some kind of education nevertheless and um, this one is called Earliest Spring, and it's about education at a, um, and in any case, preschool age. Earliest Spring. Iron scallops border the path, barely above the earth, 
a purplish, starling luster. Earth, a different dark, scumbled, bare, between clumps of wintered over stems. Slowly, from French windows opened to first mild, pale, after winter morning, we inch forward looking, pausing, examining each plant. It's boring. The dry stalks are tall as I, up to her thigh. But then, ah, look, a snowdrop, she cries, satisfied. And I see thin, sharp, green darning needles stitch through the sticky gleam of dirt, belled with white, and another. And here, look, and here, a white carillion. Then she stoops to show me precise bright green check marks, vivid on inner petals, each outer petal filing down to a point and more. Crocuses. Yes, here they are. And these point upward, closed tight as eyelids waiting a surprise. Egg yolk gold or mauve. And she brings my gaze to filigree veins of violet traced upon white that make the mauve seem. This is the earliest spring of my life. Last year, I was a baby, and what I saw then is forgotten. Now I'm a child. Now I'm not bored at moving step by step, slow down the path. Each pause brings us to bells or flames. And the other one um, is about um, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, where I used to hang out when I was, um, uh, well, 12, 13, 14. <clears throat> and in those days, um, well, even now, of course, in wintertime, there are not um, so many people around, but um, nowadays, many more people frequent um, the museum, and there are sort of spotlights that direct you to look at particular things, and a lot more guards, and they have to check your bag as you go in um, to see you're not carrying bombs or anything. But um, this is winter afternoons in the V&A pre-World War II. Rain unslanting, unceasing, darkening afternoon streets. Within lofty and vast halls, no one but I, except for the ancient guards, survivors of long ago battles, dozing under a spell, perched on the brittle chairs of their sinecure. My shoes made no sound. I found everything for myself, everything in profusion. Lace of wrought iron, wrought jewels, Cellini's dreams, disappearing four-edge paintings, chainmail, crinolines, hokusai, cotman. Here was history as I desired it, magical, specific, jumbled, unstinting, a world for the mind to sift in its hourglass. Now, while I was 12 or forever,
Uh, Copper Canyon Press in um, uh, Port Townsend, Washington, is a very fine, small press that does very beautiful books, and they asked me if I would give them a, a manuscript um, to do when they do a book by um, a better known poet, the money goes into the press and uh, helps them to produce a book by uh, um, a young or unknown poet. So I gave them a, a small manuscript and um, I'm going to read you one or two poems from that. I can't remember what I decided to call this manuscript, to tell you the truth. Um, but uh, these it's not called Dwellers at the Hermitage, and it's not called The Soothsayer. What on earth did I decide on? I really can't remember. Anyway, this poem is called The Soothsayer. <clears throat> My daughters, the old woman says, the weaver of fictions, tapestries from which she pulls only a single thread each day, pursuing the theme at night. My daughters, delicate bloom of polished stone, their hair ripples and shines like water, and mine is dry and crisp as moss in fall. Trunk, limbs, bark, roots under all of it. The tree I am, she says, blossoms year after year, random, euphoric. The bees are young who nuzzle their fur into my many fragile heart. My daughters have yet to bear their fruit. They have not imagined the weight of it. The Passing Bell. One by one, they fall away, all whom they really wanted to keep, people, things that were more than things. The dog, the cat, the doll with a silk dress, the red penknife, those were the first to go. Then father, mother, sister, brother, wife and husband, now the child. The child is grown, the child is gone, the child has said, don't touch me, don't call me, your lights have gone out, I don't love you, no more. The distant child casts a tall shadow that's the dark, and they are small. The world is brittle, seamed with cracks, ready to shatter. Now, the old man steps into a boat, rows down the rainy street. Old woman, she climbs up into the steeple's eye. Transmogrified, she's the clapper of the bell. The tolling begins. And this, this one. Um, from that same group. Um, is called cool. 
talking to oneself. <clears throat> Try to remember every April, not this one only. You feel you are walking under water in a lake stained by your blood. When the east wind rips the sunlight, your neck feels thin and weak, your clothes don't warm you. You feel you are lurching away from deft shears, rough hands, your fleece lies at the shepherd's feet. And in the first warm days, each step pushes you against a weight and you don't want to resist that weight. You want to stop, to return to darkness. But treaties made over your head force you to waver forward. Yes, this year you feel at a loss. There is no Demeter to whom to return. Or if for a moment you saw yourself as Persephone, it is she, Demeter, has gone down to the dark. Or if it is Orpheus drawing you forth, Eurydice, he is inexorable and does not look back to let you go. You are appalled to consider you may be destined to live to a hundred, but it is April. There is nothing unique in your losses. Your pain is commonplace and your road is ordained. Your steps will hurt you. You will arrive as usual at some condition you name summer. <clears throat> An ample landscape, voluptuous calm of large, very still trees, water meadows, dreamy savanna distances, where you will gather strength, pulling ripe fruit from the boughs for winter and spring, forgotten seasons. Try to remember it is always this way. You live this April's pain now. You will come to other Aprils. Each will astonish you. <clears throat> and I think I'll end with um, two poems uh, about Canada and one poem that is um, written in the three-step line, the triadic line that William Carlos Williams um, developed and which he hoped other poets would use. And I've used it rarely, but this particular poem uh, seemed to call for it. However, before I read that one, I'm going to read a group of little poems that are um, they're almost haiku, actually, but they're not arranged in quite the haiku um, uh, grouping of the syllables. And um, they're poems written um, uh, started actually on the train um, going across Canada uh, from Vancouver to um, Ottawa, which I did last summer. Um, <clears throat> there are one, two, um, there are two which are just sort of one stanza each, and then there are two which are two stanzas each. And I've arranged them in this order, but they are not exactly sequential. From the train eastward. Fur 
fiery blonde wheat field in pre-dawn light, I thought it was a frozen pond. Small town, early morning, no cars, sunlit children wait for the green light. A deer, it leapt the fence, scared of the train. Did anyone else see it? And 20 miles later, again a deer, the exact same... In Canada, a sense of weight, of burden, of under the belly of the live animal land, a clod or maybe another beast that clutches and hangs there. Florida is its tail, muscular, succulent. And in the US sometimes, a draft, a current of air chills and heightens the senses, an idea of mind, of space, of less dense flesh, something not ethereal but poignant, a head crowned with carved ice. Another one that I'm going to end with, um, I've actually uh, recent readings, I've been ending with a, a kind of um, uh, an agnostic mass that I've written, uh, but it's rather long, and I don't feel as if um, either I or probably you have the stamina for that tonight, so that's why I'm going to read this poem, which is called Improbable Truth, and this is the one that's written in the three-step line. <clears throat> there are times no one seems to notice when I move weightlessly not flying exactly but stepping as if in seven league boots yet not leagues at a time merely a modest matter of feet or at most yards I don't know how it is that no one sees it, or could it be they do and don't mention it from embarrassment? Certainly, it is strange, I know, and yet there's no need for anyone to feel afraid. I prefer not to suppose envy could cause their silence. No, more likely it's only so improbable they don't believe their eyes. For myself, I confess, it is a great delight. The springiness, the soft swing of it. Especially I like to traverse a landscape this way when there is no one looking. There is a low hill rising from marshland I've been to lately at twilight, an hour of mist and mauve loomings of vast and benevolent ancient trees. I returned only when sensing myself too close to the deepening water. Thank you.